Welcome to this first uh, Bay Area Now 6 conversation. Um, just to give you a little context about what we're doing, Bay Area Now is an exhibition, uh, performance, film, public program project that YMCA does every three years. Focuses on Bay Area artists, and each time that we do it, we try to change it up somehow and make add something to it that seems relevant for the moment. And in this particular instance, what seemed relevant for the moment was really to engage artists in some of the conversations that are happening in um, other parts of the world and other parts of the field, and particularly in ideas that come out of the Bay Area that start here and germinate and create a certain amount of excitement and then go out into the rest of the world. And I think all of us recognize our role as a geographic site of that kind of innovation and, and uh, production of new ideas in a variety of different fields. So the whole idea was we have artists involved in the conversation about things like food and technology and the environment and uh, community activism and radical identities and futurism, the six ideas that we take. We want to engage artists in the conversation. And we wanted to share that conversation with those of you who have come as uh, audience attendees so that you can, can both witness the conversation and ultimately participate in it as well. So we're doing six of these over the course from now until June, and then the, the art, so what I call the seventh conversation, which is art, which is the exhibition, the performances, the screenings, and all that. That opens in uh, July 9th and runs until October, the middle of October. Um, and in front, in front rows here are the artists who are um, either participating in that part of the project or are artists who are, are engaged in artistic production in the Bay Area that we thought were important to have in the conversation, regardless of whether they were in the United States or not. So, um, this is the first one that's organized by our curator of the uh, performing arts. <laughs> uh, curator of performing arts, Angela Maddox. Angela Maddox. So we took these ideas, and each one of the curators at YPCA was responsible for the finding the experts, who were the people that we could identify who were really involved in one of these fields and really doing extraordinary work to come and chat with us as artists about what that was. And so this first one is on food, and your people title is From Produce to Production, New Traditions in Bay Area Food Culture. And there are three amazing people here. So what's going to happen is that, um, we're, uh, we're going to take them one at a time. Then each one's going to do a little brief presentation. Then we'll have a conversation. We'll take a break about halfway through so that you can get up and stretch your legs. And I know those chairs get not so comfortable after a while. Um, then we'll come back and finish up with the final one and then uh, an open conversation. And then afterwards, the bar will be open uh, after four. Let me check my hand. Uh, after four, I just start drinking at home. So the bar will be open after four, and then you we can come out and you can socialize with each other and talk and, and you know, see what your response is. So these are three amazing people. I give a quick introduction, but they're going to know what I get to do. Uh, we're going to start with Novella Carpenter, who is an urban farmer and food activist. She lives in Oakland. She's an author, the author of the acclaimed book Farm City, which chronicles her adventures in urban agriculture. Her current project focuses on the relationship between people and animals. Uh, we'll next hear from Lee Heiden, Light Heiden Gold. Sorry. Who's Light Heiden Gold? We'll next hear from Light Heiden Gold, who is a San Francisco based independent chef and culture producer. He's the founder of Dinner Discussions, which is a monthly dinner that brings together contemporary artists, food activists, and researchers to discuss their projects and form connections. And finally, we'll hear from Brian Perry who is an eco-chef and activist from Oakland. His work in writing reconciles contemporary thinking with old practice. His recent book, Deacon Soul Kitchen, re-examines soul food traditions with innovative recipes and political choice. So as you can see, we already have got some interesting stuff coming out today. So let's try to come back. Um, so, uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Um, I wrote a book called Farm City, um, on food. There's no way to have it. It's happening. Um, so I turned around with me. Um, and, uh, I started a farm in Oakland about eight years ago. Um, it was very good. So, um, this is it. Um, it's not the big green space. No. It's a little one <laughs> where the arrow, the point of the arrow is. 
And I don't know if Google Maps is accurate anymore, but since I remember one time looking at it and being like, the garden is so much better. Um, but you guys are totally invited to come on February 27th. I'm having an open house. Um, and you can come and see the um, call on action. Um, a lot of how um, I started farming in the city was um, so, uh, this idea of food production. And then uh, kind of an aside was culture. Um, so I'm just going to go quickly through what I call my descent to, to urban farming. So it kind of started with these. Um, my boyfriend got me to have when I was back for a uh, Christmas present one year. And then um, I love keeping bees because you get to um, you know, have bees in the garden and you can watch them. It's really fascinating. Um, and then you get honey instead of honey. Um, and that's great. Um, and then uh, they also do amazing pollination in the garden. So that was sort of how I started. Uh, and then I started um, thinking about meat a lot. Um, I blame Michael Thomas, and he really got me worried about um, where my meat was coming from. Um, and so I started to think about how I really couldn't afford to go to a grocery farmer's market and buy like really awesome meat. You know, it's so freaking expensive. Um, and you know, I don't even have health insurance, so I thought, well, why not do it myself? Kind of a DIY tradition, you know. So. Um, this is what came in the mail. Um, <laughs> these are, these are um, I know, it's ridiculous how cute this is, right? Um, this is a, um, this is a turkey, the little, the little golden one right here with a little dot on its, on its face. Um, and that becomes this long sleeve that's um, very attractive on turkeys. Um, and I always say that turkeys are kind of like chicks on acid. They're sort of slower, a little bit, you know, confused about what they're doing. Um, and then there's ducklings that become geese and, and chickens in that package. That is called the homesteader's delight. Um, <laughs> and it comes in the mail, which is sort of weird. You know, like, that doesn't, you know. And this is sort of what I started thinking. These are all the things that I wrote about in Farm City were kind of like, here's how I did it. And then now, later, I'm sort of thinking about how weird it is to send things in the mail across the country. And then I open it up, and then I have some chicks. So it's kind of, it's very great for me. Um, okay, so then they grow up, and then, well, I have to actually kill this thing to eat it for Thanksgiving. Um, and so this is when we have this moral dilemma um, that, that, that hits. I mean, the interesting thing about doing all of this in the city is that then people start to get involved in, um, <laughs> in the conversation. For instance, I had a um, vegan across the street neighbor who would come over and name my turkeys, you know. Um, things like that, where I'm like, damn it, now I have to kill Harold and Mom. Um, this is actually a later batch, and I started calling naming them actually myself. This is um, Edith and Archie. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, I was always like, never, I'm not going to ever name my farm animals. Um, and then and now I'm starting to rethink that. I think actually it's sort of this nice way to sort of acknowledge that they're living beings um, and they're eating them. So this is a controversial um, animal that I raised. Um, I raised rabbits as well, um, for me. Um, and I've gotten a lot of angry letters from the House, House Rabbit Society, <laughs> um, you know, who are basically like, how oh, could you raise rabbits and kill them? It's like raising a cat and eating them. Um, and I always say, well, you have a good point. Um, however, I was raised by hippies. And um, back to the land hippies, actually. And this is a picture of me and my sister, and that is not a pet rabbit. <laughs> that's, um, that's, that's, that's going to be dinner. Um, so it was sort of this tradition we were raised in that you could raise your own food, um, grow it yourself, and be yourself in the um, Okay, well, this is sort of the bottom where we ended. Um, at one point, you know, my boyfriend and I were like, wow, feed is really expensive. Um, I wonder if we can sort of gather the waste of the city, um, you know, capture the waste stream. Um, and we uh, started dumpster diving. Um, so the rabbits mostly would go to Chinatown and, you know, get bok choy and stuff like that, and rabbits like it. Um, one time, this was, and remember, this was all happening during the economic boom. So, you know, the dumpsters were just overflowing with amazing things. And Bill and I would, my partner Bill and I would see things like, you know, I don't know, giant wheels of free in the dumpster, and we think, I bet we should raise a pig on that. And so that became the day, and then it became reality. So, um, unfortunately, I would always you know, have these ideas, and then I would have to act on them. Um, this is probably the most disturbing story that I've learned myself. Um, I'm in a hog pen with flip-flops, um, which is just, just like, who's going to do that? 
Um, <laughs> and I'm also like totally in denial at this stage of my life um, because I have no idea what I'm going to do because of like the kind of odds down. Um, and um, how exactly am I going to, where am I going to put these odds down so that I have no idea. Um, luckily, I found a chest um, in the dumpster. I mean, I didn't find it in the dumpster, I was dumpster diving. Um, and I started, you know, when we were feeding the pigs, we started off just feeding them, um, you know, Chinese food and some of the brie and peaches and, and things like that. Um, and then I realized, you know, I really needed to get them on to organic food and food. Um, because, you know, you are what you eat. And the pigs, I wanted to, you know, make sure that it was, that they were not just going to taste like long pots, basically. Um, and so I started going to these really high end restaurants um, in Berkeley and in um, North Oakland. And one of the chefs that I found, um, or he had this amazing house that he had that kind of had these chicken carcasses in it, and pigs like me, you know. And so we'd load up on that, and you know, I'd get caught in the dumpster all the time, and so I always, <laughs> and I always wear this like little minor light, you know, like a headlight. And so I'd be like looking through it, and then somebody would come and let me, and I'd just try and light on my face, and it would be this really bad scene. Um, and I would always, you know, I would say, hey, look, I have kids, you know, what am I going to do? I have to feed these kids. Um, because what I realized is you start to think like the animal that you're raising. Um, and so for me, the bottom line was getting food. Um, and so, you know, someone would throw like a hamburger on the ground or something, I'd be gagging for it, you know, I'd be like, the kids can eat that. Um, so they kind of took over my brain, and I would say that we became a kid's baby. Um, and uh, it, was, it was weird. It was weird to be in that mindset. Um, so anyway, finally, I would get caught in the dumpster, and they would keep telling me, you should talk to Chris, who's this chef. And um, so I got a hold of Chris, and um, finally, realizing that I didn't know how to make prosciutto out of those giant ham butts that you see there. Um, and Chris said, yeah, I'll, I'll take you. I'll, I'll take you on. Let's do a census trip. I'll teach you how to make salumi. So then when the big day comes, um, you'll be ready to go. Um, so that's the thing. And they got big. And then this, this picture is really disturbing to many people. How many of you guys are vegetarians? Did not say that. Okay. okay, so sorry. Um, I'll be quick about this. Um, one of the things that we realized was, I think they look optimistic in this picture too. I just want to say that. Um, but um, you got to remember, these pigs were eating amazing food. They were eating better than I was. Let's just admit that. Um, and at the last um, couple of weeks of their lives, I was feeding them beaches from the dumpster. So they were just, you know, for them, when I took them up to the slaughterhouse, they were sort of like, oh, what next? You know, it's like pig camp or something like that. Um, anyway, and one of the things that we did, Chris, was like, you know, we have to respect the animal needs every piece of it, every, every scrap of it. So you get the birds, you get the pigs, you get the tails, all these things. Um, so with this, we made um, so for Um which is this amazing red piece. Um, it, was, it was super good. And it was also this uh, kind of, um, it was the union between, um, you know, a chef and a farmer. You know, we cooked up the heads. And then we sat there and pulled out the meat and then made this beautiful, like, salami, basically. Um, and, um, and it tasted a little bit like pizza. So it was this amazing project. Um, and then I think what um, I just wanted to talk about quickly, you guys read the essay um, from Why Look at Animals. Um, just because I'll read that. So it's not true. But one of the things that I liked about it, um, I just read a couple uh, sections and then kind of riffed off of it. Because, you know, with, with the end of farm saving, you know, I had done all these things, I made this food, um, and now the next book that I'm working on is sort of grappling with our relationship with animals um, on a deeper level. So this is sort of you know, opening me up to what to do about it. The 19th century in Western Europe and North America is from the beginning of the process, today completed by the 20th century corporate capitalism, by which every tradition which was previously meditated between man and nature was broken. So, you know, one of the things that I wondered about is like, wow, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Why do I have all these animals around me? I have goats now, um, because I needed a long-term relationship to the pigs. Um, and why do, I, why do I insist on having all these animals around me? There's something fundamental about that. You know, there's like, you know, it's something that's just, it's bizarre, it's a weird tip almost, like, am I an animal hoarder? 
um, what's, what's going on? Are they going to be on the television show? And so I started to think about that a lot. And, and one of the things that I realized is that I don't want that circle to be broken. I want to have that relationship with animals. I want to look those animals in the eye and be like, I love you, and you're going to be my dinner. So, you know, there's that great line in this essay where he says, the peasant is not, the peasant is glad to, I'm not going to read it, it's not going to be a story, it's not going It's talking about the reason. What is significant and so difficult for urban standards to understand is that the two statements, uh, the, the two statements in this sentence are connected by an and and not a but. So the sentence is, um, a peasant becomes fond of his pig and is glad to sell the pig. So there's this sense of like, and especially when I had, um, you know, vegetarians would come over and look at the pig and they'd be like, oh, how can you kill this pig? Um, and so it was this, um, it was a conversation that I had to with myself. How could I? And, you know, when we go to the grocery store, no problem. <laughs> Everything's packaged for us. You don't have to look anything in the eye. You don't have to think about it. Um, but when you're raising it, every day you see that and you know, you're going to, you're going to be there. <laughs> you have to repeat that. So that, that um, thing to yourself. Otherwise, you will be like, oh, it's a cat. And so I think we've become really, um, our relationship with animals has become almost a, a, a little bit perverse, you know, with the pets. You know, you have your pug, and it's, it's um, Paul Shepard calls um, animals, you know, pet slaves. Um, <clears throat> and there's slaves in our image, right? You know, that's sort of like not so useful. <laughs> they don't really do very much, but then they just exist um, because they're our creation. <clears throat> but for me, I started thinking about that. Well, my domestic animals are the same thing. So we've created them, like I have Nigerian dwarf goats now, right? They're like these little mini goats. Um, they're extremely cute. I love to milk them. Um, I love their milk. Um, but at the same time, they are a reflection of who we are. They are, the animals tell us about ourselves. Um, so you look at them, and they have, they have been bred for, you know, 10,000 years to be this thing, which is our helper and our provider of food. Um, so it's this, uh, it's a really primal relationship, but at the same time, it is constructed by nature. So then I started thinking about wild animals, because my dad is a squirrel kook. He like, lives out in the woods and boat hunts and, 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 and all these things. Um, and I encountered a hawk in my, at my house one time, and it's my head landed to, you know, check out the chicken scene. <laughs> the chicken. <laughs> I remember looking at this hawk and just being blown away. When you look at a wild animal, it's totally different. It's they have no, they're your equal or better. <laughs> so you didn't create them, and there's something so amazing about that. And I think we're wired for that. And I went and saw, I don't usually go to museums, but I was happened to be in New York with that exhibit. You guys may remember this. It was like a couple years ago. There was a, like a pack of wolves. Do you guys remember that? Was, who was that? Do you remember? Well, what? That's it. And it's this pack of wolves, right? And they're just, he made them out of sheepskin and whatever. They don't really look that real. They're kind of pseudo real. But there's a moment when I remember walking with the wolves, and I like literally started crying. This is so intense. And I just feel like that's, um, that's the class, right? Wild. And we're wild. Um, so. Thanks for that. That was really provocative. Let me start by seeing if uh, any of the artists have any uh, questions or uh, clarifications or anything that you need to ask about. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just funny. Everyone, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the question is, um, you go through a ritual when you're going to kill the animal and how to kill the rabbit. It's so funny. Everyone wants to know how to kill the rabbit. <laughs> I do ritual, I do. I burn, I burn something, it's usually tobacco or sage. Because the thing is, is if you're, if you just walk out one day and you just grab something and kill it, just randomly, it just seems weird. So for me, I put on the apron, I get centered, and I leave it. So it's really important to sort of 
in part to when you're going to post something and when you're just going to have a face. I really do feel so about that. I mean, one of the times we had a um, we have goats, and oftentimes we'll have animals born in the barn. So we have to, um, we have to get rid of them. Um, so I actually befriended the liquor store owner down the street from me, um, Moses. And he, he comes over and kills, and in fact, we're going to kill one tomorrow. Um, and we do it in the Hawaiian tradition. And so he brings his whole family, and um, he actually dresses up for the occasion. And his wife shows up, and she sings a song, and then we kill the guy. So, and most stories say, you know, we're going to take him back to heaven. We're sending him home. And I was feel like, oh, thank God, Moses is here to tell me this, because, you know, me eating special sacrifice is really a big deal. Um, how to kill a rabbit. <laughs> most people, they break their necks in some way, or they bonk them on the head. Um, so that's, I use a dowel. It's just like, it's like a mop, and then I don't have to actually feel myself breaking it. I can just do it with a bit. It's a mop. That's why I'm going to have to do it. It's incredibly quick. It's incredibly quick. Is it what? It's just at the other end. The goats actually take a while. And because the goats are split, they're not stunned in any way. Um, it can take about 10 minutes. I actually had, a, there was a, a recently, and one of the things I wanted to sort of talk about with this um, a while with the animals out there, you know, it's this idea of a present. They've always had that connection with the animals. You know, it's sort of, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group of people. In, in, in America, it's immigrants, you know, it's not peasants, but um, they have that connection. Um, and so I, I actually am friends with this um, older Italian man, and he came over and, and we killed um, some goats with him as well. And then he actually did know Richie. And I was like, wow, why don't, you know, can't we, like, stop for a minute and, like, hang out and talk about this? Um, and then, uh, he was like, you know, we'll say, we'll say the prayer at the dinner table. You know, so that was his thing. He didn't want to do that in the barnyard for some reason. Um, but he was an extremely, extremely good um, killer. He was um, just, it was instant. So. Knows exactly how to do it and yeah. that connection is hard to find in an urban environment like this. It is. It's, it's hard to find that connection, although, I mean, I will say that most of the immigrants that live in my neighborhood will often give me tips about various things. You know, when I had kids, people from the southern diaspora would come over and be like, we kill a hog by this. Or, you know, someone from Cuba would be like, here's how we do it, you know. And so it becomes this whole conversation about. Um, their culture, you know, ultimately, um, how it's done. And then that made me feel, um, and that paired with working with Chris, the Italian butcher, um, you know, it made me feel like I was part of this long tradition, and it wasn't this, um, you know, just savagery. It just felt like it was culture. Um, yeah. Mr. Wong, thank you for uh, exposing the eyes to that experience. I think it's absolutely fantastic and dedicated to the community. Uh, amazing. Uh, the story feels to me very definitive, however. I mean, I look at the date, it's uh, uh, completely in 1977, if I'm not mistaken. And the ending of the story itself, uh, it's pretty bleak. I mean, it says, like, this relationship lasted for a very long time, it's over now. Uh, do you think that, um, based on your experience, of course, you are operating uh, much later than the 70s? So do you think uh, there is hope now? Obviously, you are doing that. What is your perception of how the people doing what you are doing? Is there hope that this relationship can be recuperated somehow? Mm -hmm. um, I think there is hope. I, I know what you mean. It is very big, um, especially this damnation of the city, right? I, mean, I will never look at a zoo in, in the same way again. It is this horrible thing that you the animals are able to look at you and you have no, you know, I've always wondered why, why it's so different. Um, I do think it's, I think there's hope, but at the same time I feel like we are very, um, that we've invented these animals that are alive. And I don't think that, you know, nature, we love nature, right, but we're destroying it. <laughs> so how are those wild animals going to live? Yeah, so I don't know. 
But you can have a connection with, with you know, bartered animals and, and, and domesticated animals. And I, I mean, you know, I said the thing about how this plays. I mean, I have a cat that is a love object. You know, it's just, that's his job is love, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it, but I do feel like it is very great. I feel like we, these animals are, um, these animals are sort of, there are creations. It's not. It's not a creation that the real has to do with it. But it's it's that. Okay, over here. So, um, would you describe um, the space in which you live and kind of how the animals live in that space and maybe just like the geography um, and how do they interact with you and you know between your house and all the like. With the classical pens and areas, or is it kind of more alternative? How do you experience that? Good question. I know I, know, I can't take very good pictures, so I can never really show my space very well. Um, so the lot, I have a 4,500 square foot lot, and that's where we keep the bees, um, and occasionally we'll keep some chickens out there as well. I and mean, then there's a backyard that's smaller, it's so maybe a thousand square feet. And that's where the goats and, and the chickens live together. So they have a um, commensal relationship that um, the chick, the, when the goats poo, the chickens run for it. So they love to pass through their their food for whatever reason, um, which is like something satisfying to me. Um, and the um, and the goats eat alfalfa hay, so I go to feed schools and um, buy alfalfa. Um, and they um, goats are notorious feed wasters, um, so they have uh, they have like a goat shed where they live. Um, at night, especially in the Mediterranean. Um, and then they actually have, when I first got the goats, I did not realize this, but of course, they are, you know, they live in mountains, right? That's their traditional Mediterranean, and they were wild. Um, and I have these back stairs, because I live in the apartment back stairs. Um, and then at first, then they did, they can run up the back stairs, up and down, up and down, up and down. So it's kind of like their treadmill or their mountain top or whatever. Um, and I didn't realize that they would do that. I'm like, shit, that's loud. <laughs> um, so, of course, my downstairs neighbors have to be done with this kind of thing, too. Um, so that's been an interesting human interaction. Um, we do have a place that's screened off for there's no animals allowed. <laughs> but for the most part, when you open my back door, there's usually goats sleeping on that back shelf area. Um, because that's what the sun is, and they like to lounge there, and they feel safe. Um, and uh, there, yeah, so the, and then the rabbits are actually on the deck. So it is extremely, it's close quarters. Like, I see animals everywhere, you know? It's like the rabbits are on the deck when you walk up to the house, they're just right there. So um, most people who are normal would have, like, a deck out there where they would sit and drink their coffee. And um, they have this, like, giant rabbit operation right there. Um, and one of the things that I do I'm really proud of is they are in cages, the rabbits are in cages, they need their separate areas. Um, because it's like that idea that their nature is to burrow, to live, to, to be in a, a safe hole or something like that. Um, but in order to get them exercise, I rotate the doe. So when I want to impregnate a doe, I'll bring her down, and the male actually runs around. He's free range. So he runs around sometimes in the house, <laughs> um, but mostly on the ground of this deck. So he has full range. and. Um, it's interesting because I'll notice that you know, he favors certain does over the others. So those does will stay with him for 30 days, and then when they're about to kindle, which is not their babies, I get them into their separate cage with their nested box and then take another female down and he gets to hang out with her. Um, so it's, yeah, that's it. So they do get, they do get exercise. The goats, um, the goats, they're Nigerian, so they're quite small. Um, but I do feel like I should probably take them for that. <laughs> but I haven't quite it. I haven't quite yeah. figured it out. Well, when I do take them out to watch, they freak out because it's so urban. And I remember one time, just a quick story, um, I was walking the goats. We took them out into the playfield, actually the big green field that we saw. And um, we heard gunfire, which is pretty typical in our neighborhood. It just happens to be like that. Um, and um, these little kids ran up to us and they were like, what's this going And we're like, oh my God. And we're so sorry, are you guys okay? Or what? They're like, we're scared of the goats. So the gunfire was totally normal for them, but these goats were weird. Um, and so it was this haunting thing about our society. Um, yeah. So there you go. There's a space thing, you're negotiating with downstairs neighbors. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're negotiating somehow with zoning. With zoning and neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. 
But Oakland is fairly lenient about it, and they're, they're, it's legal. Everything that I do is legal. We don't have to pay taxes. Um, okay, has my enjoyment of meat changed in any way? Well, the thing about, um, you know, especially when you're eating the animals that you raised and fed, you don't want to waste. There's a sense of not wanting to waste any of it. Um, and so there's that, that sort of thing. But the strange thing that I've noticed is that I'm fine. I live in an urban area. I'll go eat Chinese food with long times in it and not think anything about it. You know, I mean, I do think about it. But um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting boundary. Um, I know that the meat that I'm eating at the Chinese restaurant and the long time <laughs> came from the same place. Um, but when I'm eating rabbit that I killed myself, it's a totally different eating experience. And so with the pork, um, you know, it's, just, it's totally sacred to me. Um, and somehow more delicious. <laughs> so I don't know, it, it sort of felt like this, it was very, it was very satisfying to eat the food. It was a feeling of completion, whereas sometimes when you just eat food out of the restaurant, you're just like, yeah, that's a good one. So I wanted to ask you, there's, there's a statement you made about the realizing this relationship between humans and animals is a primal relationship constructed by man. And I was just curious if that resonated or anything that we've been talking about since resonated with you in terms of your practice as an artist. The uh, sort of primal relationship constructed by man, that idea, and anything like that, that somehow make you think about your work as an artist and kind of like connected to a similar kind of thinking or feeling about what it is that you say. Or it's just right now what is our rectal place, right? Because if you look back in the history of urban farming, it's like there always was urban. You know, like if you look at the Aztecs, they were going farm right there in their huge cities. And so that's our, and that's our construct, right? The museum or the place that you see a theater where you watch theater, but you know, hello, that was happening. Theater was happening out in the wild and the fields and whatever, yeah. So it's really, yeah, and to break that down is just really good, you know, because you just feel like, and people are like, I can't hear it I feel like we do sometimes have to step back and acknowledge our practice or our body of work or our skill set or even our interest as a thing that is outside of us, you know, and approach it with a sacredness similar to what you're doing with all of us that work. And, you know, it's hard sometimes when you're a, a mid level or emerging artist because you have to continually identify and claim and articulate your ownership over what you do. But as an artist, I think it's just as important to sort of step away from it and understand that, like, it is its own wild. Force or energy, you know, similar to that. I would say that I'm not off on that and ask if anybody's willing to do as she did and say, yes, and there was a ritual that I performed before I engaged in this primal practice, which is a creation of my art, and what is it? I realize that's deeper personal, so maybe you don't want to say, but. 
Does anybody like that? This does anybody feel like before I approach my creativity as an artist, before I begin to create my work, I do this ritual in order to put myself in that space. I just don't want to say. <laughs> but, and just to jump in really quickly before I forget, as I was reading this essay by Gary Snyder, and he said that it's not the body that makes you realize you're an animal, it's your brain. Because you can't control your mind. You can't control it. You can try, you can do your own or whatever, but that thing is working, and you have to, you can push it in a certain way, but you can't control it. So it's waiting and waiting and being a conscious waiter until the moment's clear. I think it's similar to you know, sing a song for myself or anything, but it's, it's that kind of um, intentional stall. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like creating that context too, right? Like, I, I can't, today I'm going to sit down and create a great work of art. Instead, it's like I'm going to create all this context around that enables something to occur. And I, I need to be able to recognize that and, and go with it when that happens, as well as with the time that that's not it. That's not it. Yeah. Other people? Almost as if, if I if I name it or if I touch it, then it's and I wreck it. So I have to like not allow that to happen. Yeah, that's good. I'm not an artist um, as I don't perform, but I do perform because I teach cooking, mm-hmm. and uh, I come from a tradition where cooking can be a ritual if you look at it, but. Um, I teach elevated cooking, mm-hmm. where my philosophy is about the ritual and the honor with which you cook. So we divide it into, we call it the tantra of the kitchen, kitchen tantra, where you, we start with what we call kriya, which is the ritual. The second is kare, in those Sanskrit words. Kare means attitude. And the third is yoga. And the fourth is anatta. So, karya being attitude, I suggest that my students or people, my audience, does not cook when they're stressed or when they're angry, because that translates into your food. And thirdly, the yoga is your the union with yourself, and that does mean either yoga or meditation. And fourthly, anatta is actually the wow factor. It's that you get it. That experience that in it can be expressed in words. It's an experience. So, um, to, to, for me, beyond the ritual, is actually what this exercise does in the context of your inner landscape. Yeah. Uh, let me shift the gears just a little bit here, and, and um, I was hearing in your uh, conversation presentation. How you reconcile what many of us might have a small dilemma about eating what I love. And I'm just wondering again, I'm going to ask the artist if you're not that particular small dilemma, 
if you found yourself in a place of work and engaged in that moment where you had to really reconcile something that was um, felt like it was completely outside your going against your plan or your moral universe and how you felt like that. Um, and then of intention or something uh, is a way and I don't want to kind of move around that but this like literally working on life like working on body working on um, it's kind of similar in some way and so, uh, so what do you re- what's your response then do you sit with it do you accept it do you like beat yourself up a little bit do you question your souls what do you have how do you deal with it all of those things <laughs> <laughs> no and so much just um I know in my process, there's just so much um, talking uh, to the performers. Um, and then also just the acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement and acceptance of conflict and difficulty and that it is, uh, it is kind of, um, it's a difficult relationship. Just like eating meat, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, um, yeah and, and for me, it's a conversation between you know, it's, uh, of course, you're going to work with other people, but it was interesting you said about language because, you know, with animals, we develop language because they want to make sure we see them, they become symbols to them. Um, and for me, you know, I, whatever you want to say, just about it, by saying that we enter the past today, it's just the animal lives because I brought it to life. I breathe rabbits, I um, need to go to it. So it's just, yeah, it's a bonus that we do with a different species. Yeah, sure. Just to add to what Laura was saying, just sort of the ways that you can reconcile or deal with or move through and keep working and doing what you're doing. Also, to acknowledge, like, the big word for me is just contradictions. Just acknowledging the existence of contradictions and really shrinking into the fact that that's part of what we do. And it's amazing, actually, to watch you talk about the work involved because you do bring up some really emotional stuff in yourself around the idea of wildness, the idea of killing major, major things, right? And so I think that as much as we theorize and think about this and go to our offices and do our work, the contradictions are palpable. And that's, yeah, that's yeah. A surprise in there. Yeah, and, and also just to add a little thing to that is um, I, I think there's this, you know, especially in the food movement, you know, there's this kind of righteousness like, oh, well, I only eat free range stuff that I bought, you know, because I can afford it or because I'm this moral person. And I'm kind of willing to admit that I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> and that we all are, you know? I mean, we cannot be perfect. And, and you just to let that go is just really... Well, I think there's just a... Actually, I think there's a whole social milieu that we're operating in there is such a, there's such a, a pressure and a desire for this cut and dry, yes, no, mm-hmm. like that. And the inability to hold contradictory ideas of one space and really know that they're contradictory and know that that's the state of being, right? And I think artists understand that in a way that perhaps other people are not, uh, don't necessarily do. We want the clear, clean, reason, you know, and we as artists live with these contradictions all the time, but live with these contrasting impulses and really fights that occur within us within the people we work with.
Giving such importance to ritual and uh, eating and death and life is pretty different in our life together. And the process and our thinking is really kind of just exists. I mean, we try to give them more importance to certain things, but a lot of these actors are really dramatic and kind of everywhere. And, and even in an international sense, I think you know, other people might be more um, in touch with these things, but as Americans, and other than I'm here. So, you know, going back to New York City, the spectacular of Norway, just like the the mere madness of the city, uh, it was hard for me to to get centered to create. And so, yoga was was so essential for me in helping me to find balance and to really open up other channels to really, you know, get to the bottom of why I'm doing this work. Energy to drop on, but even now, as someone who's very busy, we just want to be sure you know, how they're just just guided in a way that comes from a place that really wants to move people. And they see myself as a community organizer, a base builder in the sense of having my work move people in an additional way to really think about being political on the but also being on television and having books and having a sense of you know, things for everybody. Yoga has also really helped me get back to the true sense of why I'm doing this thing and helping me to get past all of that. The things that I think are hard to do and taking it back to people and taking it back to the environment and really helping focus on you know, why I do the uh, work that's worth it and not get caught up in all the things. I know we have a million points.